Dr. Shukbar, I'd like to start with the last point that you made, and that is that actually, if the carbon emissions haven't started reducing by 2017, it's too late. Yes. So I think that that's one of the key messages that really needs to be made more clear and more loudly. Um, it's very evident from the science that if we want to avoid what we might call cl dangerous climate change, which we generally take on an international way to mean two degrees temperature increase um, compared to pre-industrial values, then it's essential that we peak our emissions in the next 10 years or so, um, and then dramatically decrease global emissions there afterwards. But because of the fact that a lot of the infrastructure um, that we're putting in place at the moment um, would uh, it contribute significantly to those carbon emissions. Unless we really address those carbon emissions by 2017 or so, um, then we would find we'd have to retire some of that infrastructure early, retire assets early, in order to peak emissions by 2020, 2022 or so. But that's only just over five years ago. Mm -hmm. In five years in the future, indeed. Yes, I know. And I really don't think that people appreciate the level of ambition that's necessary in order to try and achieve that on a global scale. Now, you talked about mitigation. What exactly do you mean? And by mitigation, I mean um, reducing global emissions of greenhouse gases. What is the risk posed by climate change? Well, I think that some of the some of the, the results that I showed today um, very clearly indicate that in two different worlds, in a world where you do nothing to reduce greenhouse gases um, compared to a world where you try and significantly reduce greenhouse gases and stay within this two degree um, temperature increase level, then you get very different impacts in terms of different parts of the system that might impact either businesses or individuals. So the sort of areas we might look at of food, um, because that has a significant impact both on businesses and on individuals. And if we look at food in the case where we don't reduce our carbon emissions by the end of the century we could be looking at something like a 50% reduction in the suitability of crops in, in, in currently um, cropland regions. If we look at water we might be looking at something like 850 million people uh, at increased risk of water stress and if we look at flooding then we might be looking at something like a 50% increase in um, the hazard associated with those people who live in flood prone region. So whichever part of the system we look at, we're seeing significant increased risk of each of those different events in the future if we don't um, try and address carbon emissions. And actually, even in the case where we do it, uh, we do address them, you still are going to see significant impacts in each of those different regions, which means that adaptation is essential as well. You talked about the global average temperature and dismissed it as meaningless. <laughs> well, the reason that I say global average temperature is meaningless, it's incredibly meaningful for answering the question, is the climate changing? Because from a physics perspective, it makes sense. But if you're worrying about impacts, if you're worrying either about um, uh, uh, risk management for addressing those impacts, or you're looking at um, adaptation strategies to um, cope with those potential impacts, then the global average temperature is not what you're worried about. It's the local temperature changes, particularly local extreme events. It's flooding, um, it's um, uh, 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 either severe storms or severe heat waves. Those are the sort of impacts that actually have a direct effect on people and businesses rather than the global average temperature. Final question. You and your colleagues are doing enough to warn us that, that change needs to take place, we need to plan properly. Are we planning properly? Are we taking your advice? Well, I've, it's frustrating almost from a scientific perspective. I, I've given a number of these sort of presentations recently, particularly in po pointing out the timescale on which we need to make really serious um, uh, ambition in terms of the, uh, in particular in terms of the international level, global level of carbon emissions. Um, and the response that I keep on getting of late is people say to me, why did no one tell us this before? And I'm thinking, well, we've been telling you this. So I, you know, I find it quite frustrating that we don't seem to be doing a good job of communicating. And I think one of the key things that we need to start moving towards, not just as scientists, but as a community in general, is changing the frame from one of being a fear story to one of being um, 
an opportunity you know if we can if can we can really address um, this climate challenge then we actually can address many other challenges at the same time I gave some examples of where addressing the climate um, uh, parts of the challenge can actually have impacts in terms of food water and energy security as well there are significant co-benefits so I think if we reframe this in terms of an opportunity either a development opportunity or business opportunities the world is going to be changing that's what the science says but change can be either seen as a threat or as an opportunity and if we consider it more in that frame I think we might be starting to have more effect.